Excellent. Well, thanks, guys, for coming on. Um, yeah, and sorry, you're wrong, Keenan. It is Super Leeds today and four games to go. We're going to start. Sunshine down here and hopefully the storms will stay off. And so I want to thank you, firstly, for coming on. Feel free, like I say, to unmute, come on and ask questions. I really, the last couple of uh, webinars have been more like podcasts and I'd really sooner us engage and share experiences um, rather than me just present. So first off, who are, who are the most important people in sport? And so I'm, I'm look, talking globally rather than just soccer. Anyone want to put in some answers or, or unmute and come on quickly tell me? Who are the most important people in, and I'm, I'm talking more grassroots community sport. Brilliant, the players. Um, Volunteers and players. There's a clue in the uh, title of the uh, podcast. Well done, Kate. You win. The coaches. And I'm going to say more than the coaches, and I, I do want that engagement, more than the coaches, it's the parent coaches that are just getting their children into sport. It's not so much the coaches of my generation. It's the parents of the U4s are probably the most important people. And they're not quite into the game yet, but they're going to be the coaches, the administrators and the referees that take us forward. And what I what I want to ask is, again, I know when I came to Canada and we became citizens, the mayor insisted that we all take up volunteer positions. So we, I do want to focus on that slightly. And we all start out as a volunteer some, at some point. No one comes into a paid position in, in coaching. So why did you start out in, and I want some you to do some self-reflection as well. What was your goal when you started volunteering within sport? And it might be as a coach, administrator, a referee. For me, it was to gain experience to become a coach. I, I was still playing soccer at home and someone said it's a great idea to go in and do coaching and who knows, you could create a job from it. Um, who knows? At the time, there was no job, so I had to set up my own business doing it. But again, I recall Sylvie Bellevue, if any of you know her, she is a former um, national women's coach and team player. She'd done a great presentation on the magic ball once. And she held her soccer ball up and said, this ball's magic. And she said, why it's magic is it's enabled me to travel the world, meet exciting people, challenges, opportunities. And that's one of the things that I feel we should be expressing to the parents of the U4s, the U5s. The opportunities that volunteering within sport can offer instead of, and I'll, I'll keep going on about this, that we need you. We want, we want to offer opportunities. So some of your answers, I ask all the time, why, why do you volunteer? And a lot, of time a lot of times people will come back and say, I played, want to spend time with my kids, and the answer's there. And it's all about what I can do and what I can give, a sense of obligation. Really, we don't want people coming for a sense of obligation. You'd like them coming because they feel that they're going to contribute and they're going to gain something. So I think for a long, long time, we've we've come at the wrong angle in sport and really burnt out a lot of grassroots coaches too early that they haven't continued in sport. And I said it here, um, in my role at Middlesbrough Football Club back home in England, I had 50 part-time coaches working for me across the town. They would go into schools during the day and work in the academy at night. And Middlesbrough is a unique club in England. 90% of their support base comes from within 25 miles of Middlesbrough. And everyone wants to work for their favorite club. So they'd all come and say, I want to be a volunteer. And my answer would be, I don't want to volunteer. I'm going to pay you. And so you're going to be accountable because if they were volunteers and going out to schools and late, I've got no recourse. And that, that first experience is a case of putting them in the trenches. Some coaches then come in expecting everything. And we all have to work through the tr trenches, whether it's in our careers, at school, wherever, within coaching. So also the other consideration is the first step used to be as an assistant coach. And I ask this on many of presentations I do with the coaches and parents. I don't know how many of you have been an assistant coach. I used to hate the experience of being an assistant because traditionally it meant carrying balls, cones and discs and just following the head coach. So that experience sort of turns people off as well. 
So we've got to look at the opportunity that we offer as lead coaches for the assistant coaches to develop. And I know we've got Kate on here and she's worked with me a few times with the provincial team and she was given as much a lead as, as I had and if not poss possibly more. So when we get our new coaches in, we've got to make sure we support them, whether they're volunteers or paid. Um, we need to offer support in order for them to develop. Like I say, many hands make light work. Um, board of directors, coaches, managers, there's lots of roles. So we're not just talking about sports coaches, but I want to come more from that angle at the moment. But even as I'm talking about coaching, think about how this may apply to a board of directors. Um, team managers or program organizers. Um, in preparing this presentation, I did look up some research. This was a quote within there, and it indicates that most volunteers are, uh, are motivated by their own needs, their own needs and interests. Yet when you ask them, they don't specifically um, imply that. They say that I want to give, but we do. We must draw some benefits from it. We must get some enjoyment from being in that coaching role. And one of, I'm um, talking recently on coaching circles, one of the key uh, motivators that I really love hearing some of the coaches say is, I love seeing the development of the children. I love seeing how they grow from session to session and over the course of a season. So how can we encourage that within coaches and support them so they can not only help the players grow, but see that development as they grow? So question, as an organization, how do we recruit our coaches in the first place? Because if you don't have new coaches coming in, your program's never gonna grow. And, you know, I, I sat down and pondered this. Some people may advertise and do a real formal structure of interviewing. Others will pressure parents, come on, we need you. One, two, three, maybe four phone calls. We have no coach. If we don't get a coach, there's no team, we need you. So again, the image on the right is the press gang from many, many years ago back home in England, where we used to send people out to um, colonize the world, including soccer. Um, are we still trying to do that, press gang parents in? Some may be coach recommendations. Maybe you've seen a coach working somewhere else or they were a former good player. So you offer them an opportunity, you see something in them that you feel will be a good coach. Competitive positions, I hear this you know, come to our club, work in grassroots, and we'll get you on a tier one team. For me, as a manager of grassroots, that doesn't really sit well. If you're a really good grassroots coach, work there. Um, when you see grassroots coaches going off working in high performance when they should be on the grassroots field, it sort of irks a little bit in terms of what are we actually achieving here? So some people may see grassroots as a pathway to higher performance levels. Great, offer of that but never forsake where you've come from. And then obviously you've got the honor, honorarium. Um, paid positions. Some, again, the, these, these come over time. And I see many coaches that are offered that who come in with a higher level, maybe qualifications and say, you know, I've got my C license. How much are you going to pay me? It's again, a question of what you're going to deliver as well. So please think about those. Now, some of the incentives that I've heard thrown out over the province since I've been here 12 years, there was one case of a particular club that put on a massive uh, banquet, rewards banquet at the end of the season for all their coaches. They spent $10,000 and talking to the coach who led it, he was disappointed um, because they didn't get the gratitude for the presentation that they thought they'd get. And it made me wonder because as a volunteer coach, working all season, two or three nights a week, and then to be offered a big banquet, I don't know if that would sit well with me. What I would soon is the $50, $100 gift card presented to me as an individual. Thank you, John, for your time. Take your partner out for a meal. Have a night on us. So sometimes we've got to think about the extrinsic and the intrinsic rewards that we offer. Um, again, Valued and loved they've put in there. And I think this is really, really key. And I've got Leanna Hall from Grand Prairie, and I'm going to talk about this because this is something I, I asked for the Grand Prairie to consider is how do we reward our coaches at any level? And the one thing we want 
in any grouping that we belong to is to feel valued and loved. And when I look back on the coaching process, like I say, we press gang a coach, we put them for a coaching certification. With, we say thank you for doing that. We paid for it, but thank you for doing that. Here's your balls. This is your group of players. And we sit them out on the far side of the field and we hope all goes well. They're, they're not supported. They're not sort of mentored through their development. So it's, it's no wonder that we do lose some coaches along the way. Quickly then, um, I've talked to this many years ago at a meeting and what is the greatest expenditure to your club, your community? Is it the awards? You know, we see a lot of money spent on medals and trophies, equipment in terms of uniforms, um, showcase trips, field time. Field time is now at a premium, $150 an hour. And how much is spent on coach development? So I want to pose that question. And I posed it once before, and I, it was interesting because I had a a executive director come up to me and say, you threw me there because we've just spent X amount of thousand dollars on brand new uniforms for the whole club. And I want you to think about when you may have started playing or when you got your children involved in sport. How many of you chose a certain club because they had a nice uniform or they had a great field time? Or was it because maybe the coach was appealing to your child the coach had that connection, um, made the child feel welcome, made you feel welcome, valued. So I'm suggesting here that it's the coaches that attract people to clubs in the first place. Once we get involved in the sport, yeah, we might choose clubs that are going to offer us a higher level of uh, performance or commitment. But this is the question I want to pose. Um, and I, I'll say this from experience like, like i say i was based in cochrane i had the pleasure of working with many coaches quite a few years ago and there was one family husband and wife coaching team that coached their daughters from u10 up to u18 not once did they have to um, recruit players they simply ran the team and the girls just signed up every year because they were happy so there's no case there was no case of recruiting or finding or going around schools asking players their coaching brought the players in if you've got a weak coach that's not being supported you're going to lose players and, and programs so i want you to think about the return on investment are we building programs um, and to fulfill the obligations of the parents are we just building programs or are we going to support those programs with good coaches and that will be your volunteers as they come in and then nurturing them and developing them over time I'm just looking there, biggest expense is league reg registration, um, which is an interesting one, um, Henry. And like I say, I'm not too involved on the league registrations. I can't address that. I'm looking at the grassroots and coaches. Um, for me, positive coaches build positive programs. And I say this all the time. If I was to be enticed to a club, wherever it was on planet Earth, the first thing I would do, my first focus would be to develop the best grassroots coaches in that community because I know that they would build the club. Now, volunteerism, some some interesting stats here um, from Canada. 2013, 46% of the population aged 15 over volunteer. So there is a big take on it. And 55 56 billion dollars saved in one year through volunteers so we've got to value the work that people are doing and you can see there 64 percent are male probably because they're coming home and going out to work a lot of mums are home with the children but i'm pleased to see that we're seeing a lot more female coaches coming into the game when we look at sport in sp specifically 41 percent are 35 to 45 year old volunteers so we we need to look at who who the who the co volunteers are we going to recruit who are we targeting and how can we support their needs so it's, it's generally a 35 45 year old young parent um and the average lifespan is three to five years um i, I imagine most of you on this webinar have been involved in sport more than five years like myself so 
My next question, and please come back and answer if you can, why? What kept you involved in sport? Why didn't you drop out after three to five years? What, what, was, the, what was the attraction? And maybe it was career development. Maybe it was enjoyment. Was it funding and, and support and a career path? Anyone come in and give me an answer. What can we do to keep coaches beyond the five-year span of a volunteer? Anyone want to join me? Hey, John, I'll tell you. I stayed, yep. in, I stayed involved because my daughter stayed involved. She stayed involved from U10 all the way up until U19. And then she went on to college, and I still stayed involved. So she was involved. She loved what she was doing with the organization. She was happy, so I was happy to stay involved and help the organization. Brilliant. Has anyone else got any reflections on why you stay, stayed involved in sport? Again, I've got Claire there saying because she got mentoring and support. So it wasn't for the nice uniform, health and wellness. Again, going out on the field after a day at work sometimes can seem, be seen as a burden. For me, when I talk to coaches, I'm saying I might have had the worst day of my life. But when I cross that white line with a group of children, I, I need to be engaged. And like Matthew said there, it's fun. I need to have fun. So we need to sell that opportunity. And this is what I'm, I'm suggesting is that too often, and I've seen it in a lot of clubs I've been involved with, both in Canada and in England, where we, we sell the opportunity in a negative slant. And I think... You, we need to consider the opportunities that we do offer through coaching. And they're going to be different. You know, if you've got a new coach coming in, a youth player, you're giving soccer instruction. And then I don't know about you guys, but I certainly became a better soccer player when I started coaching because I had to think about what I was doing. You know, we look at some of the top players in the world um, who have tried coaching and fouled miserably because they didn't understand how they played the game. It had just come natural to them. Again, with the youth players, probably one of the barriers that they can have is the communication methods, how to engage children, how to have fun. You know, I'll say this even watching my own son as, as he coaches. He's not as confident as myself who's been in the game for many years. So how do I get him there? I need to go and mentor him and give him the support. Um, returning coaches, I hear this all the time. When I, we, when I travel to province and we go into communities and we offer coaching clinics and I'm told, oh, the other coaches, they're not coming because they've been in the game for three years. They already know what they're doing. And I, I smile every time I hear that because I don't know what I'm doing after 30 years. There's so many new trends going on and we need to stay current. Um, if you look at the coach education profile now, which I'll show in a minute, it's so much more advanced. And even now with COVID going on, the protocols have changed. We need to stay abreast. And I'm sure some of you, the, the clubs have been doing the training in order to run a cohort. And so we need to stay concurrent. And it can't be a case, well, I was a good, I played for the provincial team when I was 15. So I know what I'm doing. No, coaching is different to playing. Um, experienced coaches, for me, if you've got experienced coaches, and when I've been doing some coaching circles, it's been fantastic that we've got you know, I was in Red Deer and we've got young coaches coming in with some experienced coaches. The value of the mentorship and giving back to other coaches as well as players is so key, like I say, to keep the game going. Um, I'm not an important coach anymore. I, I don't, I really don't feel that. The mums and dads coming through now are more important than me. So what can I give them to make their journey better and keep them involved in the game? Like Leanne has just said, if it's my kid just playing, fantastic. But is there another stream that we can go down where, where maybe our children are no longer involved? How do we keep those coaches still involved? Investment. So these are some of the things that we offer coaches. Training shirts, uniform, coach education courses, internal development programs. You know, and I got asked a question in a webinar recently um, about the preferred training model. Why is it not meant, made mandatory? if that's what you want. And it's an interesting one, internal development programs. If you look in the two biggest cities, you'll see clubs that are supported by the English, the Italians, the Germans. 
and we all come with a different culture and clubs should be allowed to do that but we want still to develop the the the, the, the game so internal coach clinics who's leading those and what is the content honorariums and gifts at the end of the season these are some of the ideas that people coming in with and i want to put it out there the return on investment 15 returning players um times the player registration how much money does that bring in if you do a really really good job you know has anyone got any other incentives that they might use for coach recruitment and coach retention if anyone wants to come online and just share those have i missed anything there does anyone do anything different offer incentives? I know, you know, some some clubs have offered free fees if you've got more than two children in the program. You know, when I'm Roxanne, I love the opportunities for coaches to network and share ideas. That's the idea of the coaching circle that I'm doing at the moment. Um, you know, it was going to go live and I was going to travel to province and do um physical coach demonstrations we're now doing it online i've got a couple of more opportunities and the key for it is to get coaches talking to each other because these last two three months the one thing that i've managed to do is reflect back on my career and in doing so i've reflected back on when i came into coaching i was taught how to coach soccer the, the rules of the game and how to coach positions and technique so when I got my first coaching job, that's exactly what I did. And I didn't really understand the players. I just coached the game. And I feel that we've got to change and we've got to coach the players. And that sharing of ideas and experiences is where we can really impact our own development in terms of that. So we've, we've got to take the game back to coaching the players rather than the game. But we need coach education. And I'll say quite candidly, um, there's a, quite a lot, lot of knockbacks saying, how are we going to get volunteer coaches to do the training? They haven't got the time. They haven't got the uh, expense. It's a lot of commitment. But in order to develop the game and to give their children and the parents' children the best experience, we need to get coaches trained. Um, I, I addressed this once in a, in a meeting and said, would you send your child to a school? with volunteer teachers rather than qualified teachers. So we do need to try and develop our coaches and get them through qualifications. And this is an example of the current training that's available and needed in order to produce very good coaches for your club. So if again, if, if I was to be at a club and develop a cohort of coaches, I'd be asking, they do the safe sport. It's a two hour online free course. They'd need a police check. We need to make sure that we're employing um, quite clear coaches with no criminal record, background checks. Making headway, another two hours. Um, addressing concussion. Again, growing up, we never worried about concussion. It's a big concern in sport nowadays. Respecting sport and eth making ethical decisions. Uh, changing the way we... we educate and train sport it is becoming more professional you know even last week i saw another case um on the internet about abuse whether it's bullying of athletes or sexual or, or anything we, we need to be aware of what other coaches are doing around us and what we are doing as coaches in order to keep people in sport and playing and then the nccp courses again the active start fundamentals it's only 90 minutes online the field um, element will come down the road uh, once we get through COVID and through this virus. But there's nothing to stop, and they're free of charge. There's nothing to stop any volunteer coaches going online for 90 minutes, uh, forsaking uh, an episode of Bachelor, whatever's on the television nowadays, and doing their online course. So these are the, this is how we can invest in our coaches. Some will say, I haven't got time. But if they're committed, if they really wish to make a difference to these young athletes and children, these are the things that we need to ask them to do in order to develop our club and our program. So quickly, Leanna Hall is going to come on. I'm going to talk to her briefly um, about our experiences when we went to Grand Prairie because 
I think I said this in another webinar. I, last year, I went up to Grand Prairie for three weeks and I offered training on the preferred training model and long-term player development. I then went in the middle of the program to review how it was going and address any concerns. And then we went at the end. And most of the coaches, I didn't know. I, I went up for one weekend of training. We offered free clinics and said, if you can't come to the training, please don't apply to coach because we need you to buy into what we are delivering in order to present it in a way that the parents can see that we're all on the same page and the players can enjoy it. Um, and I think out of the, we had about 70 coaches. So Liana, do you want to come on? And how many coaches did we have? Can you confirm that again? Are you there? Uh, from U5 all the way up to U13, I think we had 80 plus coaches. So we got 80 plus coaches, volunteer coaches predominantly, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Come out and they didn't, not all of them had the MCCP training, but they went through a training information session with me, correct? Correct. Well, yeah, almost all of them did the training session with you. We had a handful of kids uh, or uh, coaches that did had some sort of soccer training, whether it be NCC or the soccer for life or something, but generally, most of them uh, bought into the program and came to the training that you offered and then were willing to, you know, step on the field and, and help us deliver the program. Okay. So can you can you give give us just an overview, right? So a lot of those were new to Grand Prairie soccer coaching as well. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. At the early at this at the younger age groups, a lot of those parents were brand new to, to our soccer program. And some of the older age groups we've had some of their kids have been involved in our in our in our soccer programs for the years, but they were still willing to buy into the program and come out and help. But at the earlier ages, yes, most of those parents had no preconceived idea of, of you know what Grand Prairie soccer was or what kind of programs. And so, yeah, they were pretty newbie. <laughs> so can you can you just explain for everyone? Because like I say, I've I've been doing this for eight years now, and I think most people have heard me talk. How, how did it come across, you know, from the first session through to the middle one? And what were the major concerns from the volunteer parents? And then also, did you how did you recruit any future support within the program? Okay, well, well, with with the the grassroots soccer program itself, um, um, most for for uh, for me, when I'm talking to parents and, and helping uh, GP soccer, most parents or volunteers don't want to get involved because they don't think they know enough about soccer. So what we really tried to do with your training session and with my support is to get across to them is that they don't actually have to have a whole lot of soccer knowledge. Um, and that somebody would be there, myself or you or other coaches, there would always be somebody there on the night to support them. And the other idea that was really great for the, the newbies, like the grassroots kind of parents that didn't have a whole lot of training, is with the grassroots program, um, they only really, the way we had set it up, they only really had to be responsible for uh, one drill or one mini-sided game, small-sided game a night. And they didn't have to entertain uh, a group of people or a group of athletes for the whole hour. They just had to know understand one small side of game and they actually then we had the groups rotate through so they got a chance to improve their coaching you know at least three times because we had at least three groups sometimes we had four groups so they would run that that station or run that mini side game the first time and they could see some personal growth by the end of one evening because they got a chance to run that one game four to four times so they I feel like they were really felt that they were supported and it wasn't like a big onerous task where I now have to um, plan a whole hour lesson plan or an old practice plan for the 20 and I have to do it all. Um, so the way we had set up the grassroots programs, it was a way for, for parents to come in and it wasn't as scary or as intimidating. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting from some research that I recently gathered, the two barriers that I... I the feedback gave was the two main barriers for volunteer new coaches coming into sport. One was soccer knowledge and one was confidence. And if you 
think about it, the preferred training model or the station rotation is what Liana is describing. It allowed that. So I've got, again, it's so now in our resource page, a whole session plan for the whole of Grand Prairie soccer to take out to the field. So every parent turning up just had to look at one drill. They had to find their partner coach and we tried to rotate those every week so they found someone else. So if I might be with Liana this week and then I might be with um, another coach next week. So I'm learning off someone else. I'm feeling supported. And if we're both a bit blind, then I've got assistant. I was there. Um, Chris Morgan, who's a technical lead coach up in Grand Prairie, was there. And we could seek that support. So again, totally alien from when I started out as a coach. It was a case of go do your badge, pass, fail, find a team, go coach a team. Um, this way we're bringing parents in and there was one lady and Victoria, uh, yeah, Liana can talk to her. I still remember in the first session, she turned up in full soccer uniform. She'd been out and bought special soccer uniform because she was going to be a soccer coach and she looked fantastic. And I thought, well, obviously she can play soccer. She, she turned out in the kit and unbeknown to me, it was the first time in soccer uniform. So yeah, Liana, can you explain a little bit about Victoria? Yeah, she was, uh, she, her daughter wanted to be, wanted to play soccer and she wanted to be involved with her daughter and she felt like she could offer something to the program. And so on our first day, she, she really needed um, a lot of support to begin with, but from the beginning of the eight week program or the 15 week program to the end, um, it actually, she actually was starting to give feedback to kids. She was, um, you know, she was giving ideas on how to maybe switch up the drill or and stuff like that. And she had a bit of a voice because when she first came into the program, she was quite content to just be somebody's assistant and sort of help her corral the girls and sort of run the game. But by the end of the 15 weeks, she was actually talking soccer and she was actually feeling like she could run a drill. And, you know, her voice was still, you know, she's still quite quiet. But there was so much growth from the beginning to the end. And she signed up to coach again in indoor. And I was then from indoor again, she, you know, had a lot of growth. So she did really well. Like, huge growth. So, yeah, again, so for, for those listening in, again, a lot of parents will do that. They'll sign up and feel that they are just there to, to keep the kids in a group and make sure they're safe. They're not going to do much coaching. So it comes back to what I've said before and to many coaches what is your goal from soccer this season what are you what are you trying to get from for your development throughout the season now most people sign up like victoria and they come along they have no clue what's going to happen or what they're going to get from it and i'm saying even myself as a coach i'm still setting goals for myself for the whenever i get back out in that field with a team how am i going to challenge and push myself and i think this is something we need to do for our volunteers to value them, give them the support, guide them and show them how they can develop. Now, what were the major problems that you might have had with your coaches, uh, volunteers, Liana? Um, well, because they're volunteer coaches and um, they're working and they're parents, uh, our biggest problem or our biggest issue that we had to sort of, sort of problem solve around is if coaches were late and they're late for various reasons work uh, kids you know all that kind of thing so we you know had to problem solve around that um but basically that was the biggest thing most of the coaches um most of the coaches were there and they were engaged um and so they were quite willing to learn the drill and they were quite willing to help us out with the program and for the most part it was great it was just those ones that, you know, when they were late or couldn't show up or, you know, life happened, um, that was difficult to try and make sure that we had enough coaches to run the program. How did you do that? Well, we started recruiting uh, some of our U16, our U15 and our U18 sort of competitive players. And we asked them to come out on some of the nights. And that was amazing. It was amazing for the program and it was amazing for those U15, U16, U17 players. And so we could slide those U15, U16, U17 players in where a coach was missing. And um, it was great. It was, it, it worked out better than I thought it could have. You know, and it's, it's a key, 
um, concept maybe for some new coaches to come in, have a youth player who can give the coaches the confidence on some of the moves. You know, I know for myself to be coaching young children, I'm not really near their age. So I'm not as cool as maybe I'd like to think I am. If they've got a young 17, 18 year old player who can do the moves and pull the moves and talk maybe more of the lingo, it's, it's going to draw the children to them. And it's, it's another key one, I think, is understanding, and I say this to coaches all the time, that when you step on the field as a coach, those children don't really know our backgrounds. I've ne I never have a five-year-old child ask me where I've coached. They're not interested. They're more interested in themselves playing. So if they've got a young child in there, or even a, a volunteer parent who's not new to the game, they're not going to ask. We've got to ensure that the coaches and the players who are going to become coaches go on with confidence. So to have a youth player working with a mum or a dad would be a fantastic way to to break down those that that discomfort and really build the comfort level within the, the volunteer coach. Um, can you tell us also, because I know we did do, you did do that, and some of the rewards that you offered throughout the program? Uh, well, we had we got a community sponsor and we had uh, coaches of the week. And so we highlighted coaches from each of the different age groups and groupings each week on our website. And they uh, got, a, got to take home a, a coupon for a free pizza. So that was each week of the program we highlighted online. Um, some highlighted some of the coaches. Uh, we also did a coach appreciation night towards the end of the 15 week program and we brought out pizza and food and uh, drinks and stuff for them. So while they were coaching, they could stop by either before or after their coaching session and grab food. Um, we, uh, the board of uh, directors at our, at our club actually came out and presented um, each of the coaches with the coupon and personally thanked them for helping us get this program up off the ground. Brilliant. And again, I know talking to Liana, we spoke two, three months post that my support and I asked Liana to look back and say, come on, what was the one take home? What was the one change that happened? And it was making a community and making, and I, I observed it. You had children come in, parents on the side were watching and more engaged to want to come in and listen to the jokes that the coaches were, were having with the players. And it was on one field, so it was more of a community. And I, like I say, I go back to when I started coaching, it was intimidating. I was on one field, probably half a field, with my group of uh, 15 nine-year-old boys. Parents all went off, and I'm left there by myself to make it work. Was it comfortable? No. Did I stick at it? Obviously, yes. Um, did I have someone to support me? Yes, I had one support coach who I could call if there was a, a, a challenge. So... One of the things that I know to move the game forward in, in Canada is we do need more coaches and we need to encourage more coaches to step up and, and continue coaching, you know, and we see it all the time. Again, when children drop out of sport or I've seen it, I, I know one particular family where the mum comes in and she does a really, really good job. And the lady I'm thinking of is fantastic, fun, engaging. She's a player and she got to 10 and passed on to a husband who's a hockey coach because she didn't really understand the tactics. And I'm like, baloney, she did. And if she didn't, we could have taught her those tactics. She should have stayed coaching. But sometimes we see a glass ceiling that, that, there that isn't. So can we, can we make our coaches more comfortable and give them the tactical knowledge through the, the, the training and the uh, coaching circles? So we encourage the coaches to stay in and get the benefits. So maybe even if a child leaves the sport, if my child decides at 10 he wants to go and do another sport, can I stay involved in the sport because I've learned so much and I, I'm, I'm enjoying it? So that's another key thing. Um, in terms of the indoor, what was the return of coaches for you in Grand Prairie, Jenna? Um, actually, what I found quite surprising is the, the amount of coaches that we retained from outdoor to indoor we had a whole new group of coaches. So they, like the kids that were playing outdoor versus the kids playing indoor was like for the most part, a, a very different group of, uh, of coaches, but they had heard about the program from the outdoor and we actually didn't have that part of the time um, getting enough coaches. So even though we had a lot of brand new coaches, even moving from outdoor to indoor, 
they had heard about the program and of some family and friends or whoever else was playing and we had parents willing to step up and try this this program because it would have been such a big success in the summer so what what sort of support or feedback did you get off individual coaches um they liked that they didn't have to be responsible for the whole hour they liked that they were always usually coaching with a partner or if it wasn't a, a coaching partner we had a u15 or a u16 uh athlete there to help them um i was there um so that they had questions about how to change the drill if they didn't think it was working or the mini game was it working they could ask me because i was there they liked that uh this field was set up for them when they arrived so all they had to do was worry about running their mini side of game and they liked that the kids were always busy like they, they were, the kids were not they were always engaged they were always touching the ball they were always moving yeah i don't know how many of you guys um are using the preferred training model I know when I've actually coached within it and when I've watched the children, there's no 10 minute drinks break. Um, time laces, the children are on the go and even chatting to coaches, they're tired when they come off. They, they love it, they're energized and they're really tired. Um, in terms of taking it forward, if you was to offer advice to another community in recruiting, retaining and empowering volunteer parent coaches, what would your, be your advice there? Um, they, they need to feel supported. And like, because I was there every night and I got to know every group of coaches that were coaching each of the different age groups, I could see the parents that were really enjoying what they were doing and had a real aptitude. And those people need to be recognized and they need to be talked to and told that, you know, you're doing a great job. You should consider doing it for indoor. Um, because I think a lot of times we get we get these coaches and they're just off on their own little team and we're hoping they're doing a good job and nobody ever checks in on them. Nobody ever gives them feedback. Nobody's nobody's there just to say, wow, that was great or thanks for coming. So I think you really need to support them. If you support them, they will they'll go a long ways. If they feel supported that they're having fun. And so somehow you have to have somebody checking in on them and making sure that their experience is a good one and that they have everything that they need. And when you see a coach that maybe needs some sort of training or some sort of support, you need to make sure and give it to them because then we'll keep them. Because the, the key is, again, if the coaches feel happy, confident, and are having fun, that's passed on to the players. Has anyone got any questions that they want to put to Liana while she's online? Um, like I say, I walk this every day. And I, I am really appreciative of Leanna giving time tonight to to give a, a, an observation from actually implementing this with my support, but from a distance. Has anyone got any questions or any feedback? So some of the things that uh, need to be considered, right, is um, the coaching was mandatory. We really did, I did insist on that. And like I say, the reason it's mandatory, and I, I really do not like the word mandatory, because if someone tells me I've got to be somewhere mandatory, I never get there. The um, reason we ask that is when you're on the field and a parent um, challenges a coach, the coach must buy into why they're doing a certain thing. If they don't, it undermines the whole program. And I think to have a group of coaches all buying in on the same page the program is really supportive um not only to the players but also to draw more parents in recognition coach of the week now it's the same as player of the week do we go through and give it to every single coach or in giving it out do we really recognize the development that's gone on and what the coach has put in like i say victoria is really vivid in my mind because i remember seeing her that first session thinking she looked like a soccer player then realizing she wasn't going back at the end of the program and seeing the transformation. And this transformation, we've got to recognize and let her know it's not just on the soccer field. This will transfer into uh, communications out in the community in her job. Um, coach feedback sought and acted upon. We need to seek that feedback. What do you need? So one of the things Liana said there is some of the session plans were written up and they were quite um, succinct, but they needed developing on. and. 
So we need to keep feeding coaches on ideas and how to do it differently. And there's even now I'm, I'm doing drills that I've done this certain way and I, I look over and a, a coach has added something onto it and it's fantastic. So we need that open mind from the coaches. Coach communication, Liana, like she said, was the central focus point. She was there and the coaches would arrive and, and you know what it's like when you're going into work and your boss is already there and if you need them, it's, it's a breath of fresh air, you, you're relaxed. Now, the other thing is there was a central equipment and collection point. That means that as coaches arrive, they have to come together and talk to each other. You know, again, how many clubs give an, a coach equipment and say, go off for the season and we, they disappear over yonder. Here, the coaches have to come in. So they, they start talking. How's the day? Looks like it's going to rain. It gets engagement going. Um, uniform, Grand Prairie, one color shirt, lots of pennies for different teams. If we're wearing a, a green shirt, fantastic. We're all on the same team in Grand Prairie. We're not dividing communities and, and parents and clubs. So I'm saying they're mix and matching partners, but I also say players. And then a gift voucher. If you can find a sponsor, that would be fantastic. Is it easier to find a sponsor when you do one big central venue rather than splitting teams off all over the town? And, you know, I've done some of these festivals before and we've, we've got the local Tim Hortons to come down. I remember doing show at Park about five years ago and it was freezing. It was promising snow and Tim Hortons come down with coffee and chocolate for the kids. So engage other people and let them see. You know, if, if you've got, I think in Grand Prairie, Riliana, we had at times 100 kids coming out to the field. They're going to bring parents. So there's a captive market for local sponsors. Um, again, parents and coaches, they enjoyed it. You know, we asked people. It wasn't a case of saying, this is what we're going to do. You better buy in. Did we lose some parents along the way? Yeah, quite possibly. When I, again, someone asked me, well, I asked Canada Soccer this. Why is it called the preferred training model? And who called it that? What's it preferred to? And they said, well, we're not sure. I think it might have been Tony Fonseca, the former TD. And they said they look into it. They haven't come back. But when I, I thought, I again reflected, would I have preferred to have grown up with coaches who are engaged and coaching me than coaching in and playing in a team where I'm spending half the time on the bench? And I personally prefer this this method and when we look at coach development and volunteer empowerment if a child joins at four by the time they're 14 they've been in the program 10 years if you look back on your career whatever work you're doing 10 years ago and see how much progression you've made it's significant so who's to say this mum here may not end up being a provincial coach her child may end up playing on that provincial team. There's opportunities there, and we don't sell that. Instead, we say, Mum, we really need you because your daughter won't have a team. So we need to change our messaging. And certainly now, you know, with COVID, I think most communities are down 50% of registration. And I can understand that, but no one's going abroad. No one's traveling away for holidays, you know. Holidays are either in Alberta or maybe over the border in BC. So let's, let's try and engage with the preferred training model. And another question that has come up recently is, what should we be doing in team play? And, you know, some a lot of clubs are working their players in teams and getting ready for when we get back to league play and the uh, getting into provincials. This has been a, such an unprecedented time for parents, for kids. No one's ever lived through this before. Um, why can't we just get out and have fun? And I, I mentioned this to one club, you know, they've got their U12 teams playing on separate fields. Why not just bring all the U12s together, mix them up, have fun, take the pressure off the coaches and just get back to enjoying the game. And who knows, in doing that, you're going to find one or two coaches. So when I've been out into communities, I've done lots of parent-child games. And when they score, the noise and the cheer are unbelievable. And I mean from the parents. So as a technical lead looking in, I'm looking for the parent who is engaged, playing, competing. And I, I, I point, I, they, they signpost themselves as a potential coach for my program. Now I need to just nurture them. But again, Liana um, 
indicated it there. If she saw a parent who was like that, she would go up to them and say, I think you would make a great coach. Not, I need you to come and coach. I think you would make a great coach and we will support you. So again, for those coaches, those involved in clubs, let's think of how we do bring co uh, volunteers in to become coaches and empower them. Um, take home notes for me from tonight. Parents of today, they are the leaders of tomorrow. If you're getting on in the years, golden years, then yeah, we're, we're going to be finding new adventures. So let's, let's make sure we can empower those coming into sport. Nurture and support the development opportunities. The game's changing and sport's changing. Promote these development opportunities. Nurture a team culture. And by that, I don't mean your under 12, tier one elite youth players. I mean, nurture a team culture within your club within your coaches to support everyone, you know, so the coach who's been there, the stalwart who's, who's played, he's working with some of these new coaches coming in. I still say mentoring, I will learn off a new mum coming in. You know, I've picked up so many drills back home when I went to watch rugby that I transferred into soccer. So mentoring isn't about up and down. It's, it's across. Um, everyone just, Please understand, everyone wants to be supported and loved, respected and appreciated for what they deliver and what they what they give. So whether it's a thank you at the end, um, getting the team uh, players to go and thank all the coaches, let's try and empower our parent coaches as they come in so they feel, feel valued. I know, again, when I coached, going back to my early days, I stuck at it. And yeah, I might get a gift card at the end of the season, which was great. But I would sooner that thank you and support from the parents as I went and a, a mentor coach. So let's, let's empower the parents like that. Has anyone got any questions? We've come to the end. Um, you know, we've got 10 minutes roughly left. Has anyone got any questions or feedback they want to give in terms of what they do at their club, what they would like support with, um, any ideas on helping each other to, to, de to develop a, a bigger cohort of volunteers coming into the game? Please come off mute and talk to me. Otherwise, I'll tell you about the game today. No one got any questions? If not, I can leave you there. <laughs>